We're continuing the continuing saga of the book of Acts. Uh, we were, uh, we had jumped into Acts chapter 11. We were looking at how to be a fantastic friend, yeah? Um, looking at uh, Barnabas. Actually, last week we didn't get as far as looking at Barnabas. We we're just kind of getting closer. But we did find a group of people who were trying to encourage, trying to lift, trying to bring people closer to Jesus. When they found people who were close to Jesus, uh, they did what they could to cheer them on, to encourage them, to exhort them. So we're continuing uh, there. Uh, before we get going, uh, keep praying with us. Uh, it was kind of fun Sunday baptizing so many, huh? Uh, it looks like this, you know, we've been, we've been talking about the possibility of baptizing 14 in 14 days. Uh, Sunday, four were baptized, right? I think this coming Sunday, there'll be six who are being baptized. So we're going to miss the 14 days, 14 and 14. Yes, sir? Oh, yay. Uh, so this Sunday is going to be Baptism Sunday again, right? The whole point, the whole reason that we're here is to help people get saved and soaked and serious. And so we may miss the 14, and we may miss the 14 days, but still pretty cool. So four last Sunday and probably six this Sunday and uh, uh, still others that I've talked to over the last uh, few weeks that aren't part of that four, aren't part of that six. So we'll just, we'll just see what God does, huh? Um, Father... Uh, use us however you choose, uh, especially for those of us who are here tonight and those who are watching, those who are listening online. Uh, God, I pray that you would do something in our hearts and in our lives that would move us beyond uh, just being nice people, just being good people. God, I pray that you would turn us into godly people who are just crazy to live for you, people who care more about other people's souls than we care about our lives people who care more about you than we care about ourselves. God, I pray that you would be, do, be able to do something in our hearts and in our lives that moves us beyond making somebody happy or keeping somebody from being mad or keeping somebody from, from doing something we don't want them to do. God, I pray that we would just live our lives to make you happy, that we would just get into your word to find out what you don't like and stay away from that and get into your word and find out what you like and run close to that. So, Lord, as we're looking at uh, these faithful friends, uh, God, I pray that more than just a few uh, helpful principles for, for living a, a good life, I pray that you would help us see you and that you would help us see uh, more of what it looks like to live for you, to really live for you. Lord, show us how to really live for you, that we might lead others to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Remember, we found last week uh, Proverbs 18, 24, and I, I kind of settled in on the King James version with all the, what, 20, 30 different versions we looked at. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, right? If you want to have friends, don't be standoffish. Uh, don't be complaining. Well, nobody's nice to me if you're not nice to people, right? A man has friends. A man who has friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. We talked about how many people kind of grow up in, in churches like this thinking that friend who sticketh closer than a brother is Jesus. But that's not talking about Jesus. Jesus sticks closer than a brother. But this passage is talking about a friend that sticks closer than a brother, a friend, a buddy, uh, somebody you meet, yeah, and specifically in the Lord. Uh, we said a fantastic friend will lead his friends to follow the Lord. Uh, that's what I think, but I think that's what he thinks too. You know that, what do you think I think about? Yeah, that's just kind of my opinion to say it like that. Uh, everybody in a church like this wouldn't necessarily agree. Some people in a church like this would think that a fantastic friend is just somebody that you have fun with. A fantastic friend who's somebody who sticks with you no matter what. Hey, you mess with my carnal, you're messing with me, you know. Yeah, whatever. I don't think that's a fantastic friend because sometimes you have good friends who mess up and you need to let them hit the bottom sometimes. You know, you be there for them, you be there for them, but that doesn't mean you bail them out every time, figuratively nor literally sometimes. A fantastic friend is not just somebody who's with you no matter what. A fantastic friend, from God's point of view, is somebody who's there with you to bring you closer to the Lord. Not just somebody who's there with you to make you feel better. Not just somebody who's there with you because, oh, I have so much fun when she's there. Or, oh, he makes me laugh. But that's not necessarily a fantastic friend, yeah? Um, wasn't there a phrase that sometime before there are, there are good friends and, and fair weather friends? Yeah, fair weather friends, are, they're there when everything's okay. And when the storms of life come, when things get rough, where are your friends? Where are your friends? Where they go? Where are your friends now? Now that you don't have any money, where are your friends? Yeah. Um, fun friends, not necessarily faithful friends. Yeah, um, 
I've had fun friends. They're the ones who try to talk you into jumping off the house with a bed sheet. And, you know. That's okay. Don't be afraid to jump off the roof. Here, I'll throw you a rope. You know, those are, those are fun friends. I've had a lot of those. Faithful friends. Uh, some people are fortunate enough to have friends that stay with them when, you know, things are tough. But again, I, you're kind of different. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you guys a little different than I talk to most. And I'm kind of rough on most. But you guys, I, I, really, I really pray that God will help us get it. A faithful friend is someone that God can use to bring others closer to Him. Uh, what, what the Apostle Paul said to, to his, his, his kid in the faith, his son in the Lord in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, the things that I've, I've passed on to you, I want you to pass on to others who will be able to teach others also. Well, Paul got it from somebody who got it from somebody, right? The things that you've learned from me, you pass on to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. A faithful friend goes out of their way to bring that friend closer and closer to Jesus. So four quick principles we're going to be looking at. We're, we're in Acts chapter 11, uh, starting in verse 19. Uh, you can be a helpful friend, a, a faithful friend, a, a good friend, if you're discerning. Uh, discerning. What does it mean to be discerning? Uh, huh? Uh, you, to be able to tell good and bad? Uh, you can tell a difference. You can tell a distinction between things. Uh, black and white, I can see black and white, but, but as, as someone who's discerning uh, can't just see, oh, yeah, black and white. Uh, that's, that's, that's black, but that's, a, that's more like gray. They both look black when you just, but look, oh, yeah. Um, whew, that's not even black. That's like dark purple. <laughs> look in the light. I'm wearing two different color socks, you know. A person of distinction, a person of distinction, a person who has distinction can, can tell differences. And the sharper you get, the, the wiser you get, the smarter you get, uh, the, 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 the more discerning, the sharper your knife or cutting. Sue and I were talking about fresh tomatoes. Yeah, I like my tomatoes to taste like plastic from Albertsons. I don't, I don't really like fresh ones. But I, I like tomatoes that are, that are firm. Huh? That when you cut, doesn't matter if you're using a sharp knife or a butter knife, you can cut it. You know, not what I like. You know. And I like to bite it. I like to put salt on it, and it just sounds good. But if you have a sharp knife, it's easier, isn't it? You just last night, Lauren's home. Yay, she's home. She's been gone for 25 years. Last night, I'm lying in bed with all 27 pillows in Chester, and I started thinking about uh, uh, Bill Klein. Bill Klein was one of the professors at Denver Seminary, and. Uh, thought about him for a long time. He, he just, I, I appreciated uh, uh, the way he taught. I appreciated the way he spoke. What I really, I can still remember the way he wore a, a, a wedding ring and a, I guess a class ring. And whenever he'd speak, he would do this. And whenever he would do this, you would hear. <coughs> That's important because the, the, it was a master's program, three-year course that I crammed into six. Many of you have heard me tell that story. And I'd fly into Denver early in the morning, and I'd get there, and I'd try to stay awake through Monday classes all day long. And then Monday night, I'd fly back to Albuquerque. Well, his was generally the last class, and it was important to hear him go, because it would bring me back. One of the things I so remembered about uh, Bill's uh, uh, teaching, uh, his New Testament classes, he used words that were just, to me, spellbinding. They were just, he didn't use big words. But he, used, he always seemed to use just the right word. And I always got the sense when he'd, and he'd lay out a phrase, he'd, he'd explain a passage in Scripture, I always had that sense that it was an incredibly sharp knife, like the ones on the infomercials at 2 in the morning. And, you know, the ones that can cut the piece of paper and the nail and still cut the tomato, one of those. He would just cut it so fine, so fine. So fun. When I teach, I feel like I'm using a sledgehammer on a mushy tomato. You know, anybody remember Gallagher used to hit the fruit with a yeah, that's what with a mallet. I appreciate people who can teach with such uh, uh, understanding. They they have this discernment first of all, but they can communicate with such a distinct in such a distinctive way. People who were discerning can tell the difference, not just to protect themselves. But, but to proclaim to other people and to protect them as well. We're talking about faithful friends now. You can be a, a helpful friend if you're discerning. Verse 19, Acts chapter 11, verse 19. 
Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, they went as far as Antioch. And they began to speak to the Greeks also, not just the Jews. These were Jews who were afraid. Uh, remember, Stephen was one of the deacons, Acts chapter 6. Uh, the, the widows in the church, um, there, there were hundreds and hundreds. In fact, on, on one day, 3,000 people believed and followed the Lord in baptism. That, that included, that was in addition to the others who had already been saved and had been baptized. But there, there, was just, there were just tons of people. They had come from all over the then known world. They came to Jerusalem as proselytes. Uh, they, were, they, were, they weren't Jews by birth. They, they chose to be followers of God through that faith as a, as a, as a God-fearer. Yeah. And they recognized then through uh, Peter's preaching and through the apostles' teaching that Jesus was the Messiah. They turned to him in faith, and many of them didn't have gas money to get home. Many, you know, they got a text message in the middle of a church service, and it, what, I don't have a job. A lot of them lost their jobs. A lot of them lost their monies. A lot of them lost their family. Many of them, including Stephen, lost their lives because they had given their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. Well, after Stephen, the, the widows in the church, there were many, many people in the church, and there were a group of widows uh, with, with a, a, a kind of a Greek heritage. There were widows in the church with a Jewish heritage, and they were kind of nee, 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 nee. the Greek widows were saying the Jewish widows are getting fed first. They're getting their box of groceries first. They're getting their scrambled eggs and bacon. Well, they probably didn't have bacon, but you know whatever. Yeah, they're getting served before we get served, and they were nah, 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 nah. and the apostles got together and they said, you know what? It's not that we're above taking care of the day-to-day the -day needs of, of our baby church. But, you know, we've been called specifically of the Lord to pray and to proclaim, to just get close to God and, and prepare our hearts and then tell everybody what God is, is, is sharing. It's not that we're above, you know, mowing the lawn or, 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 or cleaning the bathrooms or, you know, straightening the pews or raking leaves. It's not that we're above that. But it's, it's right for us to do what God has equipped us to do, right? You pick from among you, what is it, seven men full of good report, full of the Holy Spirit, and one of those men was Stephen. Well, Stephen was an evangelist. He was a preacher. He, he told, he cut the word of God with a, with a sharp knife. And people heard Stephen's words, and they, and they were convicted in their hearts, and they turned to God in faith, and they were saved. Yeah. Well, Stephen was arrested, and they gave him a chance to recant. Uh, just like uh, Miriam Abraham, is that her name? Uh, the, the Christian, she's being called, she's a Coptic Christian, a Catholic. Um, but she was arrested for not converting. Uh, she was, it said she was Muslim. She converted to Christianity. She says, no, I grew up a Christian, again, Catholic, but they're calling her Christian. Um, and she wouldn't convert, so they jailed her. They sentenced her to be hanged uh, because of converting to Christianity. I'll get there in a minute. And uh, because, uh, and for adultery, because she married a Muslim man and they considered that uh, uh, sexual sin. So she was going to be hanged, I think. Yeah. And uh, she was pregnant. Uh, her two year old, I think, was kept in jail with her. And while still in chains, uh, she gave birth in the jail and finally was, was released. Yeah. Uh, they told her, all you have to do is recant. All you have to do is just. Turn away from Jesus and, 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 and just tell everybody you're what you are. You're Muslim. She said, I'm not a follower of Islam. I'm, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And she wouldn't turn. Stephen was given that opportunity. Turn away from Jesus Christ. I, I can't. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. And you remember the story. They stoned him. They killed him. And who was one of the authorities standing by holding the coats of those Saul of Tarsus that later we know as the Apostle Paul, right? When Stephen was killed... The Christians who were there close, they got all, ah, maybe we're next. Uh, maybe they're going to hassle us. Maybe they'll arrest us. Maybe they'll kill us. And so they scattered. Remember, Jesus had told them, as you're going throughout the world, preach the gospel, make disciples of all nations. And they all just kind of stayed close in Jerusalem. And when the persecution hit, the church became obedient out of fear. But they, they started to scatter. These men spread the word among the Jews, verse 20. Some of them, however, 
men from Cyprus and Cyrene, they went to Antioch, not to preach to the Jews, but to preach to the people they found there, Gentiles, right? And they began to speak to the Greeks also, Gentiles, non-Jews, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord's hand was with them in verse 21. And a great number of the people believed and they turned to the Lord, 22. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem. And everybody at the Jewish church of Jerusalem said, hallelujah, praise the Lord. The Gentiles are being saved. Is that what they said? No, 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 no. What's this? What's this? No, they can't be saved. They're Gentiles. They're not close to God the way we are. They don't understand. And you preachers, what are you doing? What are you doing? Do what you're supposed to do. Don't be talking to them. Don't play with him. You'll get dirty. Kind of that. Yeah. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem. They didn't like it. So they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And the whole reason for sending Barnabas to Antioch was to check this thing out. What's going on? We hear that our preachers are not talking to our people, they're talking to those people. And we hear that those people are praying and giving their lives to Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Barnabas, go check this out. Um, I, I, it sounds like I'm being horribly disrespectful uh, regarding this Miriam uh, Abraham, who, uh, the, the, a Christian. Uh, a Coptic Christian is a Catholic, uh, kind of like an, uh, an Eastern Orthodox. Christian. Um, you may feel that it's, it's wrong for me to cast any aspersions on Catholics because, oh, they believe Jesus too, and, and they believe Jesus died for their sins too. But uh, Catholics would be the first to tell you they don't want to be who you are. If you don't think there's a distinction, they know there's a distinction. It's kind of like people who were insisting, you need to be more tolerant and don't be Islamophobic. Don't be hateful to followers of Islam. Don't be hateful to Muslims. No, you shouldn't be hateful to anybody. But to say that Allah is the same as this God, they would be the first to tell you, no, 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 no. That's not the same guy. Your God is not the same as Allah. Uh, they're right. And where our president and others say, this is not a holy war. Muslims are not trying to kill us. Really? Methodist, old Methodist women? What? You know, who's trying to kill us? Jehovah's Witnesses? Baptists? The WMU from the, you know, Southern Baptist Church down the street? No, they're followers of Islam. Islam is not a religion of peace. It's just not. Yeah, be loving. Christ wants us to love even our enemies, he said, right? And somebody who's trying to cut our heads off. And by the way, um, ISIS is coming. They're coming. They're here. They're in New Mexico. They're here. Um, that's not a... <laughs> they're here. I mean, you'd have to be stupid to not know that they're here. Tens of thousands are streaming. Not just the regular tens of thousands are coming across the border. Tens of thousands of people are coming across the border. And our border patrol is being told, hey, just let it happen. Go change some diapers. Drive the trucks. Basically, we've turned our border patrol into coyotes. Basically, taking our border patrol and taking illegal uh, uh, immigrants, not even illegal now, unauthorized immigrants, I think was the latest, uh, uh, and bringing them across the border and joining them up with others in their family or people who claim to be their family all over the country. There are some who think this, uh, this rash of... Uh, 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 these diseases, these kids are picking up, uh, what's the, there you go, respiratory viruses. Um, it, it's kind of kind of along a band. It, it started kind of uh, East Coast, Midwest. Uh, we have no idea where these tens of thousands of kids who weren't immunized, who we have no idea what kind of tuberculosis, what kind of smallpox, what kind of, heaven only knows what's coming across the borders. Uh, where, where, did, where did they take them? They won't tell us. Huh? Artesia. We knew Artesia. Where did they go from there? Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm not saying that's it. Armijo Elementary. That's right. That's right. Now, I'm not saying everybody who's here illegally is ISIS. But we're stupid, and right now, they're not. We're doing this right now, and they are not. And they fight dirty. 
you know, back in the old days, you watch old movies, the Revolutionary War, you know, the red coats and the blue coats, and they stand all orderly, you know, with their, are you ready to fight yet? Not yet, five more minutes, you know, and these guys on this side, the enemy on that side, ready? Not yet, not yet, still drinking my tea, wait, five more, okay, ready, three, two, get ready, don't cheat, ready, on your marks, get set, okay, go, <laughs> it's like they were fighting according to rules, and, 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 and people, uh, look at what happened to us in Vietnam, you know, we didn't know how to fight, we didn't know how to fight. I mean, not to cast dispersion on, on, on the soldiers. I mean, my dad fought in Korea and, and people who fought in World War I and II and, and, and other, my goodness, we know how to fight. Our hands were tied. Our hands are tied worse now. What are we going to do? ISIS is coming for your head, literally, not just figuratively. They fight dirty. The name of the game is scare the fire out of you. All they have to do is cut a couple of kids in half. Come and just, uh, what's that? Like 9-11, but it, it doesn't seem like for most people that this kind of thing to hear about some kid's being, some kid's head being cut off, <laughs> some seven-year-old girl being held by four men and somebody else with a, basically a machete, a long knife, cut her in half in front of 100 or 200 kids just to watch, that's terrorism. The whole point is to fill people with terror. 9-11 was like that for a lot of people, but it kind of galvanized yeah, the people for like 11 days. Yeah. People went to church. And... In the United States for years before they committed yeah. that. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's kind of like a dormant. Yeah, a dormant sleeper cells. Uh, these guys are here. And again, even if ISIS, you know, them, even if they haven't come in, and they have, look at they're already recruiting our teenage girls. You know, before it wasn't that hard. You know, you go through uh, uh, TSA, you go through the airport, and, and, you know, if you look like me, you know, kind of like a Mohammed, they don't stop you. You know, they'd stop a, you know, 80-year-old Methodist woman, you know, with her walker and her cat, and, you know, hey, they frisk her, take her in the secret room, and x-ray her. How stupid is that? We're not supposed to profile. Get the guys that look like terrorists. But now you can't tell. And we're developing a culture that hates Israel and is sympathetic to these terrorists. They're coming. This is not that far away. What happened to Stephen is not that far away for us. Our military, not allowed to... I mean, my goodness, we defend the Saudis. We defend... We, we liberated Kuwait. Carry a Bible there? No way. No way. We, you can't even fly a flag here in the States in a lot of places. Isn't that ridiculous? Because you'll offend somebody. Football teams can't pray. It's offensive. Chaplains aren't allowed to name the name of Jesus. What kind of prayer is that? Thank you. Thank you. You? Sorry. Or you? Or nobody? Yeah. This happened. It didn't just happen. When you read the end of the Bible, it's going to happen again. I mean, we, we, we forget this stuff is happening all over the world right now. What happened to Miriam was, was, was horrible. What I'm concerned about, and I'm talking to you, you, you're a little bit different. Some of you guys watching online, you kind of get this. Most people don't. Because most people like us don't see the distinction between Christian and Catholic. We're just as dumb as the government who says... They're not terrorists. We're not at war with Islam. We're, you have to be able to tell the difference. You have to know that a guy who's Baptist isn't necessarily saved. You have to know that just because your boyfriend, just because your, your aunt goes to Catholic church because the, the, the pastor grew up Catholic, they know a lot about Jesus. Well, yeah, we know a lot about Jesus, but just because you're Baptist or Catholic doesn't mean you know Jesus. Right? A priest will be the first to tell you, no, we don't believe like you. When are we going to figure that out? You know what I mean? I've, so I've lost half of you already. Because we don't see the distinction, because we think that Catholic, because they say they believe in Jesus, we, we think Catholic is the same as Christian. We're just as stupid and we're, no, we're, we're not going to try to lead them to the Lord. It's too hard to lead people that you love to the Lord. It's too hard to talk to somebody who's about to die in the hospital. I don't want to bring it up. 
They'll be all hurt if I bring it up that, you, you know, you're about to die. <gasps> you know? When are you going to tell them? After they're dead and in hell? But we, we, people in churches, I guess, we're, we're, many of us are practical atheists. We believe in God. But the way we live our life, it's almost as though we don't. We just kind of believe, you know, everybody's going to get there. Like universalists. Universalists believe, oh, if there is a heaven, everybody's going to get there. A loving God wouldn't let anybody go to hell. He wouldn't send anybody to hell. A loving God gave you a way out. But because we're so, what happened to Stephen is going to happen maybe even to us. I don't think it's that far away. I don't. Uh, many of you remember a, about a year ago I told you about a, uh, a novel that, that someone told me about uh, uh, the Christ virus, about Pastor Luke Chavis. Uh, a one-time boxer turned pastor in the South Valley, took a strip club, turned it into a church. I thought, oh, that's me. It wasn't even close. But in this, in this uh, book, Pastor Luke Chavis uh, uh, was called on to stand for truth. Stand. And when the world around was falling apart because of political correctness, you can't, you can't stand for the truth anymore. If you stand for anything, you better stand for something that doesn't offend anybody. Pastor Luke just stood on the truth, stood on the truth. And one morning there were two men in suits that didn't fit in with the rest of the people who were in his little church of about 200 people. And he said, Jesus is the only way. There is no other way to heaven except through Jesus Christ. And where most of the people wanted to say amen, they were careful because the two men in suits sitting on the back row were very stoic. They kind of held everything back. And the two men in suits just stared ahead. And at one point, they stood up, they looked at Pastor Luke, and they walked out. And the next week, the doors to the church were chained, and they were never able to come back in again. Pastor Luke lost his uh, pulpit, lost his freedoms, and he decided to stand and to tell the truth. They went underground. He figured out a way to stand and to keep telling the truth. And he finally lost his wife. She was killed. Uh, how far would you stand? At what point do you just roll over and pee on yourself, you know? At what point do you just roll over and say, okay, I, 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 maybe I don't know. I, I don't know. You know, I believe in Jesus in my heart, but, you know, I, I'm just not going to. We're already there. Most of us don't tell anybody now. Most of us won't try to lead a Catholic loved one to the Lord now. You would be more, you would be more apt to try to lead a Baptist to the Lord than you would a Catholic. It's, it's just kind of the way we are. I'm telling you, until we learn to be discerning, until we learn to cut that tomato with a very, very sharp knife, until we learn what the distinctions are. What do Baptists believe? Well, it depends on the Baptist, you know? I don't believe the same thing that other Baptist brothers and sisters do sometimes. I mean, everything we believe isn't, isn't the same. Uh, when I was Catholic, I didn't believe everything that other Catholics believed. Oh, we follow the Pope. <laughs> Listen to the Pope. Really? Who oh, listen to the Pope? Oh, don't talk against the Pope. It's like, hey, don't mess with my brother. You hate your brother. Yeah, but don't you talk about my brother. You know, it's like that. To be a helpful friend, you've got to be discerning. On a broad level, do we know the difference between somebody making a decision for Jesus? Maybe they pray a prayer. Maybe they do the blue book. Maybe they get baptized. Maybe they join a church like this. We don't do so much membership. We, we more do partnership. If you want to be a member here, I would want you to be baptized. I'd want you to be attending. I'd want you to be participating. I'd want you to be tithing or at least moving in that direction. I would want you to be willing to, to, to identify with us as a church. I would want you to be saved. I would want you to be trying to live a godly life for Jesus. So if you want to be a member, just do those things. You're in. You don't need to have your name on a little index card in the shoebox in the closet back there. You need to, if, if you want to be a member, stand up, man up and be a member. Be baptized, be attending, be participating, be tithing or moving in that direction, willing to identify with his church, saved and trying to live for Jesus Christ. To really get it together, guys, it's not about being a member of this church. To get it together, it's being a part of his family and being a part of his army. And there do be a difference. It's one thing to be saved, and it's quite another thing to be trying to get other people saved. It's one thing to know Jesus, just like it's not the same as just knowing about Jesus. You can know about Jesus. I knew about Jesus. When I got saved, I knew Jesus. 
now that I know Jesus, am I helping other people to know Jesus? Yeah? Do we know the difference between decisions and disciples? This is, uh, uh, he was a pastor of a, a huge church. He's now, uh, his name is David Platt. Uh, he's uh, newly uh, elected president of the uh, International Mission Board for the Southern Baptist Convention. We're a Southern Baptist church for a, a number of reasons, not the least of which is when you, when you give in the, in the regular offering, you're participating uh, with, in the ministry with 40,000 other Southern Baptist churches in the States. We cooperate with, with more than just Southern Baptist churches, but at least 40,000 churches in the United States, some 4,000 to 40,000 ministries around the world. This guy is a newly elected president of the president of the, the uh, International Mission Board. And uh, I, I just so appreciated his message on Acts chapter 11 as I was studying for this that I, I took out a couple of clips here and there just to kind of throw at you because he said it far more eloquently than I could. His knife is sharper than my knife. Do we know the difference between just making decisions and actually making disciples? Once men and women came to faith in Christ at Antioch, they grew in faith in Christ at Antioch. The goal was not to report numbers. The goal was to raise up disciples. And we live in a day where it is easy, it is so easy for people to give intellectual assent to Jesus. And it is so easy for us to count people who give such intellectual assent. But we must call people to so much more. These disciples at Antioch were the first ones to be called Christians, the first ones to be radically identified with the person of Christ. They knew that Jesus was worthy of more than casual association and church attendance. Jesus is worthy of complete abandonment. So in our evangelism, in our efforts to proclaim and spread this gospel, may we never minimize the claims of of this gospel upon the lives of the men and women we preach it to. In the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, quoted already tonight, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Brothers and sisters, let's call people not to make a decision, but to die to themselves and to live in Christ. And let's show them the radical implications of what that means for their lives in this world. Let us be finished and done with nominal Christianity that dishonors the name of our Christ. Let's raise up passionate disciples who live and die for identification as Christians. Radical identification. You know, the, the track, you know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You know, you listen to Brother Joel or Sister Joyce and, ah, oh, they have a word for you. and They're just so lifting and encouraging. You know, the gospel is a message of coming and dying. It's a message of coming and dying to sin, dying to self, dying to everything me and living for him. That's a way to fill a church. People don't want to hear that. People want to hear how to feel better. You don't know what my boss is like. I'm probably like your boss. Yeah, I do know what your boss is like. Sorry. You don't know what it's like to be married to him, her, it, you know, fill in the blank. You know what it's like to be married to Satan. Yeah. <laughs> and people come in, they're beat up by the world, and, you know, they're having a rough time at work. They're having a hard time finding work. They're, you know, having a hard time paying their bills. They're having a hard time with health issues, and they want a word from the Lord. They just want a fresh touch. They just want an encouraging word, and I get that. I understand that. I wish I was nicer. I do. The, the problem I have with just giving you a big old hug, and, and I, I, I want to make you feel better. The problem with that is most of us are driving our car off the cliff. Most of us have chosen not to live a life where we die to self. Most of us have chosen not to live a life of full commitment to Jesus Christ. And because most of us have chosen not to live a life of full commitment to Jesus Christ, it's hard for me to just say, I love you, bye. Have a good time. You're driving that car really straight. <coughs> You're doing a good job screaming. Don't you try to warn them? You're going toward the cliff. Don't you tell them, slow down. Can't you see the road? The bridge is out but then I'm not compassionate, then I'm not loving, then I'm hurting people's feelings, you're making people mad, why can't you just be nice and lift people up, and why can't you ever say anything loving? How much more loving is that to make a fool of myself to tell you you're about to go off the cliff? Or is it more loving to say, love you? 
dang, that was a nice car. What a waste. What do you say? And, and, and if it's not bad enough that many of us as believers are living a shipwrecked life, we're still drinking, we're still gambling, we still cuss, we still cheat, we still, eh, with life. If that's not bad enough, There are some who believe, I don't know who, but there are some who believe a lot of people in churches like this aren't even saved. How mean for me to say that? But when you look at what a, what a, what a person looks like, when they come to that, that, that sense of brokenness, I'm a sinner. If Jesus died for my sins and you come to him in repentance and, and faith and you give your heart to Jesus Christ. And then I go back out and do the same things I did before? Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. A person who recognizes who Jesus is and who we are, what he did for us, and you accept it, you receive it, how can we go back like a pig to the hog pen? How can we go back like a dog to eat his own vomit? Is it Peter that uses that terminology? I'm afraid that the reason most of us are not living that radically just full-out devoted life for Jesus Christ. First of all, we love ourselves too much. That's already kind of strike one. If we love ourselves that much, are we, really, are we really saved? Okay, maybe I'm really saved, but I still really love myself a lot. Okay, but if you're really saved, now you have the, the Holy Spirit inside you. I don't know, in your arm, your foot, your stomach, I don't know how that works inside you, but in your life, it's taking up residence in your life. If you're truly born again, now you have the Holy Spirit. If we don't have the common sense to not go back to the vomit, our old life, the Holy Spirit is poking at you, prodding you, proclaiming truth to you that you've already read and heard. Don't go back. Don't go back. Don't go back. And we do it anyway. Kind of makes me wonder if he's really there going, hey, don't go back. You know what I mean? It's a judgment call. But I'd rather try to lead a Christian to the Lord than just assume that because you come, y'all are fine with God. We're not right with God until we're saved and we look like it. I'm telling you, when you get radically saved, you're going to quit a lot of the things that you're still doing. You know, you, you tease me because I give you a hard time about dancing or I don't know, what other nonsense do I talk about? Eating chocolate. Or, I just made that up because it sounded silly. But that is a sin, isn't it? Back off. <laughs> Lauren said, back off. I realize a lot of the stuff I talk about is just, you know, because I like to poke you. It's kind of fun. But God wants you to discriminate. God wants you to discriminate. I don't mean I don't like Mexicans. Let's look in the mirror tone. I don't like black people. E, white people, they're so, you know, what's a white people? You know, before 1960, most of us were white people. Did you know that? They just changed on the census. Now white people are Cuban, Latin, Mexican. It, it, they're arbitrary lines. The Bible says there's one race, the human race. And if you're of a different race, a la Bodhi, I need to bring hay for you the next service or oats or something. We're part of the human race. God wants you to discriminate, not by color, not by nationality, by truth and error. God wants you to be able to cut that tomato just sharp. And... But you can't do that unless your knife is sharp. How does that happen? And the Bible says that friends ought to be like iron sharpening iron. But not if you're not a faithful friend. If you're not a friend who's trying to lead your friend closer to Jesus, you're not a faithful friend. You might be a fun friend. And they're going to die and go to hell and on their way down to hell. Thank you, though. You were fun. No, a good friend is going to try to keep them out of hell. And if they won't listen to you, maybe the best way to scream the message is to stand away. Doesn't mean you quit loving them. Doesn't mean you won't be ready to tell them. But as long as you're telling them you can stay like you are and we can still have fellowship together, then, then you're back at war with God. Because God says, how can darkness have fellowship with light? How can children of the devil have fellowship with children of God? Yeah, so God wants you to discriminate, not by color, not by nationality, not even by language. 
He wants you to discriminate by truth and error. Radical Christians do that. I want to be one of those when I grow up. I'm already mean. I, I just have to be focused. Two, you could be a helpful friend. I'm not asking you to be mean. I, I should clarify. Sometimes I say things that are absurd because I, I know you'll get it, and then I'll find out later, wow, they so did not get what I said. They think I really... But people are going to think you're insensitive because you tell them the truth. Tell them the truth in love, but you got to tell them the truth. Being Catholic is not the same as being a Christian. Being a Christian is a Christ follower, not just somebody who names the name of Christ. Matthew 7, Jesus addresses that crowd. Oh, but Lord, I, 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 I preach sermons in your name. Hmm. I, I, I cast out devils in your name. I did miracles in your name. These are not people who are lying to Jesus. They're not, I mean, they're right to Jesus. They really did miracles. These are people who really told people about the Lord. They performed miracles. They cast out devils. They preached the gospel. But what did Jesus say? doesn't matter what you did. Away from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. To come into that relationship with Jesus Christ, it's going to change you. You're going to be changed. And people are going to think you're insensitive because you won't just let them drive their car off the cliff. You're going to care enough to tell them. And that's going to go against the grain. It's going to go against the grain. Two, you can be a helpful friend if you're encouraging people. Now, this is not what you think either. Encouraging people, chapter 11, verse 23. When uh, Barnabas arrived, now people are being saved, not Jews. Gentiles are being saved. They sent uh, the church, the Jewish church sent uh, Barnabas, right, to go check it out. Go find out what those Gentiles who are pretending to be saved. Go find out what's going on. And find out about our preachers who are talking to people who are not like us. When Barnabas arrived, he saw what the grace of God had done. And he was glad and encouraged. He encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. 24. Barnabas was a good man. He was full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were being brought to the Lord. That's a good thing. Barnabas came. First of all, they sent him because they recognized that he was sharp. He was uh, discriminating. He could tell truth from error. They sent him because they wanted to determine all these Gentiles who say they're being saved. Barnabas, go find out. If, if, go find out. They knew he was discriminating. They knew he was sharp. They recognized that. Barnabas was not just sharp, though. He was encouraging. Now, most people think that to be encouraging is to say something to make you feel better. When you look at the words that are translated encourage, encouragement, encouraging in the Bible, in the New Testament, you find that the word doesn't mean uh, making somebody feel better. You find that the Greek words that are used are words that actually make the other person better. They don't make you feel better. They make you better. Is there a difference? Yeah. Um, when Lauren was uh, little, like college age, uh, she stole. And it was, she didn't just steal by herself. It was a conspiracy. There were, there were more than one. It was, a, uh, it, it was a, like a mafia family, basically. Yeah. So her brothers, who were a little bit older, I don't know whose walkie-talkies they were. Uh, what did I say? Brothers? Old, old brothers. Her brother uh, uh, had the walkie-talkies. Uh, okay, I'll tell the story. <laughs> Sent her in the store. What happened? Yeah. And I'm just going to repeat so people can hear. He was 10 years old, you were 8. He sent her in the store. She stayed out. No, oh, she went in the store. He stayed outside, walkie-talkies. Yeah. Where the candy is in the... Two cents. How old are you? Ah, oh, wow. Not exactly with a silent headset, just <laughs> steal the candy. <laughs> yeah. And so she stole the candy. Um, 
if when Lauren's brother with the walkie-talkie talked her into going into the store and talked her into steal the candy, and she did it. If I see her stick her hand in a box, candy box, not put money in, start walking down the walkway there, the aisle, um, what would an encouraging word be? Now, the way most people would think, uh, what would you, what, you have to say something to make her feel better. Encourage, an encouraging word is, a, is, a, is an attaboy, isn't it? Yeah, you kind of get my drift. The Bible words for encouragement are not the attaboy, it doesn't matter what you're doing, even if it's bad. The Bible words that are translated for encouragement sometimes are stop. Sometimes it's, what are you thinking? Yeah. The Bible word for encouragement is, is, is from the same word that, that uh, we get paraclete from, not parakeet, <laughs> parakeet, paraclete, the Holy Spirit. Uh, parallel, side by side, parallel, paraclete. He's the encourager, the Bible says. The Holy Spirit is the encourager, the paraclete. He comes alongside. The one who comes alongside tells you what you need to hear to get on track, to stay on track, and to move along the track. Uh, you know, the Bible says that uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and in righteousness. It's to get you on track, to tell you when you're off the track, to help you get back on the track, to move you down the track. That's what the Holy Spirit does by being the encourager, the paraclete. He doesn't say, boy, good job, you sinner. You steal those candies, girl. Woo! <laughs> the encourager says, stop. Put that candy back. Like the good brother should have said, put the candy back. <laughs> Too late. Uh, Encouragement is not what you think. Um, is it possible to encourage uh, gay lovers? Is it possible to encourage uh, a guy and a gal living together, not married? Is it possible to encourage a thief? Is it possible to encourage? Now, again, don't, don't, lose, don't lose track here. Don't lose sight. I'm not talking about... I'm talking about being a sold-out, solid believer for Jesus Christ. That doesn't just mean to say something to make them feel better. We're talking about the Bible kind of encouragement. That's the word that makes them better. If I'm sinning, how are you going to encourage me? Way to go, Toad. Woo! High five. No. To be a, a helpful friend, to be a faithful friend, you, you come alongside and you tell them what they need to hear, not to feel better, but to be better. And if you're not on track, what kind of a friend am I if I don't tell you? What kind of a friend am I if, if, if I just, you come in and my sermons just make you feel better, but they're not helping you be better. I'm doing, I'm doing you a disservice. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not being faithful to God. We're not being faithful to God when we encourage the way the world says. The world says, just make them feel better. Uh, just, just, just. Just don't fly your flag. Not everybody's all rah-rah, Uncle Sam. You know, we have people from other countries that could be offensive. They fly their flag. They fly their flag. You can fly the United States flag. Can you imagine flying the United States flag and carrying your Bible in Saudi Arabia? Iraq. How many lives did we... American lives, how much money, and our guys can't carry your Bible. How, don't even think about trying to lead a Saudi to the Lord, or an Iraqi, Pakistani. Yeah. yeah. Um, at some point, guys, what did I say earlier? ISIS is here. It doesn't matter if it's ISIS. ISIS is the same as the people who killed Stephen, the same as whatever drove uh, Hitler, the same as what was driving Saddam Hussein, the same spirit that drives us until we get saved. It's the same thing. I'm not like that. God, God says we are. Jesus says until we come to Jesus Christ and there's a radical conversion, we're still following our father, the devil. Maybe, maybe we're more 007 about it. 
but you're still following the agenda of your father, the devil. It doesn't matter how politically conservative they are. If they're not saved, they're following their father, the devil. I like listening to guys like Rush Limbaugh, incredibly conservative, incredibly astute politically. I don't think he's saved. His brother has just come out with a book, David Limbaugh, a book uh, uh, basically putting Jesus on trial, uh, putting the gospel on trial. And it sounds like it's a pretty good book. David Limbaugh looks like he's a Christian. Uh, doesn't look like Rush is. But because Rush is so politically conservative and he's able to put together the conservative and the liberal news and, 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 and regurgitate it in such a cogent way that I can grasp it and whether I agree with it or not, oh, I get it. Now, now I can at least handle it and do what I want to do with it. Glenn Beck was the same way. Incredibly conservative, an amazing teacher, but a Mormon. Doesn't matter how right he might be politically. Doesn't matter how much I appreciate his, his views, how helpful he is. If he's following his father, the devil, Jesus said, well, I said it too. If he's following his father, the devil, can I trust what he says? Got to be careful. Just got to be careful. God wants you to discriminate. He wants you to be discerning. You need to get to the place where, like Barnabas, you can encourage, meaning you come alongside and you tell them what they need to hear to be better, not just to feel better. This next clip, we need to tell them what they need to hear. Uh, listen to David again. And church planning was turned upside down. Cuba is such an interesting country. He's talking From about the, the outside of Cuba. looking in, you can hardly see the church. You don't see nice buildings, you don't see elaborate programs, you don't see attractive productions, you only see the church in Cuba when you get to know the people of Cuba. When you get to know the people, you find small pockets of brothers and sisters who are spreading the gospel like wildfire. They stay under the radar in this communist setting. One, one Cuban believer told me, in communism, there is a ceiling above our heads, and the goal in life is to keep your head below the ceiling. As long as you keep it below the ceiling, you're fine. If you raise your head above the ceiling, it gets chopped off. Not necessarily literally, but that's kind of the philosophy. So he said, this is the way we do church. We keep it small. We keep, keep it simple. We stay low, quiet, under the ceiling, and quietly, exponentially, they are planting churches all across that island. Basically house churches. We went to one small, impoverished Cuban house church. This one church had planted 60 other churches. Six. We go to one of the church, one of the 60 churches that they had planted, and this church had planted 25 other churches. And so that's what I mean by exponential. And so I I remember talking with the pastor of this one church that had planted 60 churches, other churches, older brother. This guy's crazy. The communist council in his area brought him before them for questioning. And so he's, he's brought into questioning, facing threats from this communist council. And he brings a rock with him, this huge rock with him, into questioning. He puts it on the table in front of the council. They say, what's the rock for? He says, I want you to know from the beginning that if you try to stop me from speaking about Christ, this rock is going to do it for me. Even the rocks were they, thought, they thought he was crazy, and they let him go. <laughs> it just gives you a little flavor of this brother. And so he's planted from his one church, 60 other churches, from those churches, 25 multiples of other churches, just church planting like a wildfire. I said, how do you do it? I got my notes. I'm ready to write down. I'm ready to learn. I said, how do you multiply churches like that? He looked back at me, and he said, here's what we do. So I've got my pen ready. And he said, we make disciples. I said, I'm going to write that down. Make disciples. That's, that's good. And I, I, came, I came back thinking, we, we've come up with all kinds of methods for multiplying the church in our culture. We give money. We start campuses. We... Use DVDs to show pastors, satellites, and I'm not saying in any way that any of that is wrong. But I can't help but to wonder, what if we didn't have the capability to reproduce DVDs and pour hundreds of thousands of dollars into multiple campuses 
What if we didn't have the technology that we do have? And we should be wise to use. But if we didn't have those things, what if we had what many of our brothers and sisters around the world have? What if all we had was the Spirit of God and the Word of God in the people of God? This would be sufficient to see the gospel spread like wildfire across North America. Do we really believe that? What if all we had was the Spirit of God and the Word of God in the people of God? What if we didn't have this building? What if we didn't have Bibles? You know, you, you knew a little bit, I know a little bit. She knows a little bit, he knows a little bit. And we kind of gather together, we kind of, you know, as we recall, we, we, we recite Scripture from memory and uh, to be totally sold out to Jesus Christ. Most people would just kind of wander off. Most people would say, this is too much, man. People wander off when they can't find a good parking space. Are you kidding me? To have to make any kind of a sacrifice? Um, again, a little bit of a judgment call here, but when he talked about this one brother, the crazy one who was arrested, and he stood before the authorities, and uh, he brought the rock, right? What was he referring to? Uh, where Jesus said, yeah, they, they, Jesus, they told Jesus, tell your disciples not to preach, not to tell people about you. If they didn't praise the name of God, even the rocks would cry out. That brother started 60 churches, six zero, started 60 churches. One of those 60 churches started 25 churches. Um, again, this is, this is going to sound, yeah. If that didn't make you a little excited, you don't get it. You don't get it. I'm, I'm not giving you a hard time. I'm not chewing you out. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just making a statement. I'm encouraging you because God, God wants you to exhort. He wants me to exhort. That means he wants me to tell out the truth to you. And the, the truth that I'm telling out to you is that if you're not excited about reaching somebody for Jesus and you don't get just excited about hearing that somebody could actually start a church, and to hear that that brother could start a church and that people in that church could actually start another church. If that doesn't excite you, you don't get it. Do you realize that's the whole reason we're here? To reach you for Jesus, to help you become more like Jesus. You know what you're going to be like when that happens? You're going to go reach somebody for Jesus and then help them become more like Jesus. And guess what they're going to do when it takes hold? Nothing's going to stop them from coming in. Nothing's going to keep them away. And if it does, they'll figure out a way to get close to another group of believers. You know, everybody can't be here all the time. I get that. There's nothing magic about being here to magic time. But when you fall in love with God, I'm telling you, you cannot fall in love with the God of this Bible and not fall in love with His Word. You cannot fall in love with the God of this Bible and not fall in love with His people. You can't. Because the Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit will draw you to God's things and draw you to God's people. If you're not in love with God's word and God's people and God's place, I'm offering to you, I'm exhorting you, I don't know that you're in love with God. He's so mean. He's so mean, meanie. It's the same with people who won't be baptized. I don't care how many times you tell me you got saved. If you won't follow the Lord in the, in, the, in the most obvious step of obedience, I don't care if you're 7 or 70 or 700. It doesn't matter. If you're saved and you're not baptized, you just don't get it. You don't get it. It's still about you. He says it's not about you. It's about Him. I want you to be discriminating. Yeah? I, I, want you to be able to, I want you to be able to cut that tomato. huh? And I want you to be encouraging. Yeah, I want you to be able to exhort, tell people the truth, tell them what they need to hear. In Barnabas, we also see that he was influential. Barnabas didn't keep his talents to himself and didn't just show off or helpful or superstar. Barnabas was no superstar. Barnabas didn't do everything. Barnabas didn't try to do everything. But Barnabas, God put Barnabas where Barnabas was. You know, this is something I still need to figure out. You know, ask, seek, knock, ask in the whatever the heck that verse says. <laughs> I'm bad about checking that locked door, and I check it again, and I check. I'm like monk. Did I lock the door? Did I lock the door? But I'm checking to see if it's unlocked yet. Is it unlocked yet? 
I'm bad about it. If, if, if God doesn't open the door, maybe, maybe I've got another key here somewhere. Maybe I've got, maybe, maybe there's a window open. Maybe there's, that's where this church came from. I got so many no's. No, you can't start a church there. No, you can't start a church there. No, you can't start a church. No, you can't start a church. No, you can't pastor a church. No, you can't start a church. No, you can't have a church. No, you can't pastor a church. No, you can't start a church here. 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 No, you can't have a church. No, you can't pastor a church. And then we bought the bar and here you are. Did I do bad? At some point, a smart guy would wise up and say, dude, you know, just go plant corn or learn how to be a mechanic. I can't even, I can barely put gas in my own car, you know. Go do something, you know, profitable. I'm bad about asking, 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 seeking, 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 knocking, knocking, knocking. I don't know that that's the way to do it, but I'm telling you that when you fall in love with Jesus, it's going to be different. It's just going to be different. You're going to be hungry for God's things. And when you get an opportunity, you're going to try to bring other people along because you know it's not about anybody being a rock star, superstar, any kind of star. If, 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 man, if, if God is letting me do anything, it's hold the door open. I'm a door opener. God does seem to trust us with a couple of things. And uh, cool. I've seen some people come through my ministry who are, wow, and where they are in positions of influence today. I don't get to enjoy the benefits or the fruit of that, but I know who held the door open. I know who helped them get there. I know, I, know, I know some of the things God did to help them get there. Thank you, God. That's cool. Barnabas was a person of influence. Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church, this church that with all these Gentiles, that the Jewish church they said, go, go find out what's going on over there. Barnabas said, God's doing something here. And he didn't just stay there and help him out as a superstar. Barnabas went and he found Saul and said, hey, brother, come on. Remember Saul before tried to join the church, tried to get close to the brothers, and they knew that he was a killer. Saul killed Christians. And Barnabas said, hey, God saved him. He's different. Let him in. Shoot, let him in. You know, Barnabas is saying, let him into your church. Let him into your house. Barnabas said, okay. And he did. Barnabas went to get Saul and he brought him in for a whole year. Barnabas and Saul, they discipled the people in this church. The disciples were called Christians first at the church at Antioch. That's pretty cool. You ought to bring somebody with you. Many of you know in ways that I do not that when you are on the front lines planting churches in frontier lands, it is not easy. It is costly. It's costly for you. It's costly for your family. It is costly for your wife. It is costly for your children. And it can be discouraging if you forget that this is actually God's design. God has ordained suffering as a means through which we will show the world that Christ Jesus is better than health. God has ordained And Christ suffering. Jesus is better than wealth. And Christ Jesus is better than ease and prosperity and comfort and possessions in this world. How will we show a suffering Savior to North America if everything always goes well for us? I think about brothers and sisters that we have sent out from our church to one of the most, if not the most, dangerous part of our city. Families, 10 or 15 of them who have packed their bags and sold their homes in comfortable suburbia, moved into the inner city to live out the gospel, make disciples, multiply churches. And I get an email from a mom who tells me what it's like to have gunshots resounding around her children's bedroom at night as she prays that a stray or intended bullet does not come through their wall. And she writes, Pastor, this is not easy. And then in the next sentence she says, but it is worth it. Yes, because she knows and they know. They're not surprised. They know that suffering is a means that God will use for the accomplishment of the Great Commission. That's the beauty of Acts chapter 7 and 8 and 11. Yes, Christian, our suffering is inevitable, but get this, our mission is unstoppable. 
Satan's strategy to stop the church in Acts 7 only served to advance the church in Acts 8. Don't you love this? Satan strikes down God's choicest servant. Ha, he thinks. I'm winning now. Next verse, everyone scattered and preached the gospel wherever they went. Take that. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> oh, and it gets better. Think about it. Luke tells us, Saul was there approving of the execution. So Saul leads out in the persecution of Stephen, which leads to the scattering of believers, which leads to the founding of the church at Antioch, which becomes the church that sends out Saul slash Paul on global mission. <laughs> You can't write a script better than that. Saul, he didn't know he was doing it, but he was starting the church that would one day send him out. Mark this down, brothers and sisters. Satan's strategies to stop the church will ultimately serve to spread the church. Because our God is in control, and he's ordained suffering as a means for the accomplishment of the Great Commission. I love it. God has ordained suffering. It's not what Joel says. It's not what Joyce says. That's not what Paula says. You got to be careful. You're going to get dumber if you smoke dope, whether it's legal or not. And you're going to get spiritually duller if you listen to Joel and Joyce and Paula and take them seriously. You listen to that stuff that makes you feel better and doesn't make you better, you're going to get dumber. How mean for me to say that? You are. You are. You have, to, you have to listen to people who help you get sharper, not dumber. Listen to people who help you take God's Word. God's Word, not the way I teach it, not the way they teach it or she teaches it. God's Word. God's Word is going to be like fire. God's Word is going to be like a hammer. God's Word is going to be like a rock. God's Word is going to be like a trumpet, a clarion call. And it will move you. God's word won't let you stay the same. Not if it's God's word. And I wonder, maybe I messed up. Maybe I should have just left well enough alone. I'm, I'm not, porcito, that's not that. I don't want to stand in your way, guys. I don't want to stand in your way. Not if, those of you watching online, those of you here. I don't want to stand in your way from coming to Jesus or becoming more like Jesus. Maybe the no, Tony, no, you can't. No, don't have a church. No, you can't do it here. No, you can't. No, 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 no. Fine, choke on it. Go have a church. Maybe he did that. No, maybe he said, good job, buddy. Here. Maybe that's what God did. I don't know. I just know that right now, us, right now, my heart's desire is that you just fully sell out to Jesus Christ. That not another day go by, not one more day goes by without you just having your heart burn for God. God's word is burning in your heart. I got to tell people. I got to figure out a way to tell people. And you won't want to waste one more day monkeying around with your life. It's not your life. It's his life. What are we doing messing around doing what we do? Now, what we do during the day is probably our tent-making stuff, you know. The Apostle Paul made tents to be able to, you know, buy his groceries or buy his Adidas tennis shoes or what. Do they still sell Adidas tennis shoes? I get it. But as you're living your life, Matthew 28 says, that, you know, the, 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 the command in Matthew 28, 28 is not go. It's make disciples. As you're going, make disciples baptize them, teach them to obey me, Jesus said. We're wasting our time if that's not what we're doing. Your heart should have been just, just whoa. That dude started 60 churches? And one of those baby churches started, what, 20, 25 churches? That ought to make you go, wow, I wonder if I could start a church in my house or something crazy like that. Because you know people that I don't know. You can get people to your world that you're, not ever, you're never going to get them into mine. They don't need to come into my world, but we do need to get them into his. God has ordained suffering. Health is not going to bring you closer to Jesus. Wealth, 
will not bring you closer to Jesus. Prosperity, peace is not going to bring you closer to Jesus. God will do whatever it takes to get us out in the world. That was getting scattered, in case you wondered what that was. I wondered myself, what am I doing? <laughs> that nest, you know, gets shaken up a little bit. You get booted out of the nest. You go tell people about Jesus. You go tell people about Jesus. God wants you to be discerning. He wants you to be discriminating. He wants you to be encouraging. And he wants you to be including. He wants you to be, what was the phrase? I don't remember what I said before that. But he wants you to be, be bringing people in. Bring people in. Uh, we use the word discipling all the time. He wants you to be teaching somebody how to do what you do. Teach them. Teach them. Reach them. I'm still going to keep praying that God will use me. Lauren and I pray every time we eat. So like 40 times a day, me. Her like once or twice. Eats her little seeds. Wild hickory nuts or whatever she eats. Just about every time we pray. Before we feed Chester and give him his little insulin shot. Little puppy, poor guy. We pray. And part of that prayer is always, almost always, Jesus, please use us to build your church. I realize it may not happen here. It's his church. You're not mine. You're his. I'm not mine. I'm his. I'm kind of yours, but really I'm his. When we get that, we'll realize that the name of the game is not, I wish I was more comfortable. I wish I had more. It's, oh, God, I want you to be pleased with me when I stand before you. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do, Lord? Here am I. Send me. Huh? Lord, uh, I am offering myself to you again. Uh, here is my life. Here is my life. I want to be known as someone who's sold out for you, someone who's crazy for you, someone who uh, maybe could uh, be a little more sensitive in the way I go about it, but God, the time is so short. Man, ISIS is here. And whether it looks like ISIS or Al-Qaeda, or it doesn't matter. Satan's followers are here. And they want to defeat you. But you promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against you, Lord. You will be successful. And as long as we are with you, <laughs> we're going to be overcomers as well. So, Lord, I pray that you would use us to build your church. For everyone who wants to be used, God, I pray you would use them to build your church. God, for the rest of us, I pray that we'd get it. I pray that we would just come to the place where we just totally understand this life is about you. It's for you. It's from you and it's for you. Lord, transform us. Transform us. Get us back into your word. Through your word, change us. Change us. Mold us. Change us. Transform us that we might become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Thank you for everybody who's here. Thank you for everyone watching, everyone listening. God, more than anything, we want to please you. Help us please you. Make us sharper, make us smarter, make us stronger, make us willing to suffer if necessary. For your honor and glory, in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys.